Well, we've just been through that first section there, and Haggai said, have a think. Consider your ways. Uh, what's going on? You've struggled. God hasn't been with you, clearly. You need to have a good think about what's happening in your life. And so the response and the thing that uh, Haggai tells them, the word of God tells them in verse 7, consider your ways and go up to the mountain. Go up to the mountain and bring some more wood and bring and build the house. So we then have the question, well, what happened to all the wood that they already had? Because in Ezra chapter 3, it actually specifies all the wood that they brought back from Persia. Cyrus so says, go home and go home and build a house. And Ezra chapter 3, it actually quantifies all the wood that they brought home. They had piles and piles of wood all ready to build the house of God. And yet in verse 8, they have to go and get some more wood and go back to the mountain. And God doesn't want to get the wood that they've used. He doesn't say, go home, peel off all of the panels of your house and bring them back to me because God doesn't do secondhand stuff. He doesn't want our discards. God says, I want my wood. You've come back with a whole lot of wood for Persia. You've gone and fritted it and wasted it and stolen it on your own homes. Don't you dare bring that back to me. Now you have to go into the mountain and do some hard work and get some more wood. Notice how it expressly says there, the mountain, go up into the hills. Climbing a mountain requires some work. We're not going to get into the kingdom on a water slide, are we? Climbing a mountain takes effort, diligence, commitment, day in, day out, potentially. It reminds us of those beautiful words of the beloved Paul in Philippians 3. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I press. Take some effort take some diligence, take some focus. And God says, I need some action. Get out there and get some more wood. Now we notice in that verse, some very, very telling words, brothers and sisters and young people. Verse eight, go to the mountain and bring some wood, build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified. Wow. So what that tells us is when we are self-focused, when we're doing things for ourselves, when we're paneling our lounge rooms, we are depriving God of glory. Because he says, I need you to go and get some more timber and bring it back to my house and only then will I be glorified. When we panel our souls, when we put a new pergola on, when we buy a bigger and better or a flashier or a newer, it's for our glory. God doesn't get anything out of that. And when we glorify our souls, we deny God of glory. God had no glory in all of verses 1 to 6. He says you have to go to a mountain and get some wood so that I can start being glorified again. When we do our own things, we deprive our God of glory. I wonder if we've thought about that. Now, if we think about that, the scriptures are very, very clear on those principles. I just want to start, though, with another quote from Tozer. He's an impressive writer. He says here in the book, The Pursuit of God, one of the greatest hindrances of internal peace which the Christian encounters is the common habit of dividing our lives into two areas, the sacred and the secular. He's brilliant. Now, he's writing in 1948, a long, long time ago. 
and he's picking up issues with exist that existed in the Christian church in America at that time, the Christian church. He says one of the greatest hindrances we have, let's just say in our ecclesians, in our people, in our brothers and sisters, is this habit that we have of saying, I've got two lives, a sacred one for God and a secular one for me. We don't have two lives, brothers and sisters. We have one life. We don't have a Sunday Tony, who on Sunday morning, Tony says, Sunday school, program in, prepare class, deliver class. Memorial meeting, suit up, look smart. Sunday lunch, lecture, Monday comes. Now I'm back to me time. Bible goes, suit goes, focus goes, God goes, and I start doing secular. Tozer said, no way. So does the scriptures. Tozer says, this is the biggest challenge in the Christian church in the 1940s in America of people not being singularly God-focused, but living two lives, one for God and one for me. That's what these people are doing wasn't it? They had one for God and one for me. God says, when you live your life, you're depriving me of my glory. Now, the scriptures pick that up. So, put something in Haggai, if you wish, and come forward to Mark chapter 12. Fundamental quote with a fundamental lesson. Beautiful little section there and paying taxes to Caesar. I still remember the clarity of reading this in the Sunday School Notes many, many years ago and always marvelling at the mind of our Lord in delivering this. Verse 16 of Mark 12. Well, perhaps verse 15. Knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put ye me to the test? Bring me a denarius, a penny, and let me look at it. They brought one and he said to them, whose likeness, whose image and superscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Verse 17, Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him and we do too. See what Christ does here? He says, yeah, you've got to pay your taxes. That's an obligation to the earthly masters you serve. No choice. Have to do that but render to God the things that are God's. Did you notice, brothers and sisters and young people, that there's no render to me the things that are mine? He doesn't even petition off a bit of your life that says go and enjoy your bit, you know, pay your taxes, serve God, and have a good time during the week. There's no me time there whatsoever. doesn't say render to the Port Adelaide Football Club the things that are the Port Adelaide Football Club's doesn't get a look in brothers and sisters you've got to pay your taxes and the rest of the time you render to God because he is God and he deserves it now come back as well to Zephaniah in the Old Testament so just a couple of pages before Haggai that we're in Zephaniah and chapter one Reading there from verse 4 in Zephaniah 1. Tragic verses. Verse 4, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal and the name of the idolatrous priests along with the priests. Look at this. Those who bow down on the roofs to the hosts of the heavens those who bow down and swear to Yahweh and yet swear by Milcom. Wow, two lives. That's what Tozer's talking about. Those who have turned their back from following the Lord, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. Zephaniah say there are people in the ecclesia who say, yeah, I'm a Christadelphian and I swear to God and on Sunday morning they come here and 
just fit in perfectly. Doing everything right, says Zephaniah. And they go home and they swear by Milcom, the, the world, and bow down to him and her and bring all the, the rubbish from out there in. And, and they pulled it off. Now, Christ says you can't serve God and mammon because really you're either for God or for mammon. As Zephaniah here says, there are people in the ecclesia at the time who said they were serving God and swore they were serving God and told everyone we're God-fearing and went home and brought Milcom into their house. Zephaniah says, you can't do that. God says you can't do that. And that's why back in Haggai, a couple of chat pages back, God says, I need you to serve me. Come back to me. Get out of your house, your panelled house, off your armchair, go to a mountain and bring some new timber. And build my house that I may be glorified. Beautiful principles, aren't they? And then he says in verse 9, you looked for much, and behold, it came to little. When you brought it home, I, I blew it away. It's the same concepts of verse 6. You eat, but you know, had a great morning tea, but you weren't filled. You, you went and had a good drink, but your thirst wasn't quenched. You put on a nice woolen coat, but you were still cold. That nothing's working for you. Verse 9, you looked for much and God just blew it away and says it's nothing. Why, says God? Because, verse 9, of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you runs to his own house. They're running to their own house. It's a terrible little condemnation of the people, wasn't it? There's some various translations from other Bibles on the screen. The ESV says, each of you busies himself with his own house. Rotherham says, while well, you keep running every man to his own house. CEV, contemporary English version. You hurry off to build your own houses. I've done that, brothers and sisters. I've told Sarah that I'll be in for dinner a little bit late while I finish nailing the timber something to the something else. But this people ran. They busied themselves exclusively for themselves that concept of running and and busying themselves there's an enthusiasm for the things of the world they ran and they pushed hard they did everything for themselves and speaking as a, a brother speaking as a male that's really really easy to do i love extending and building I get such a huge sense of satisfaction when I do that. And when I mow my lawn, I look at my lawn and think, I like that lawn. Well, I do. I can busy myself all day, brothers and sisters. And God says, when you have, Tony, you've deprived me of glory. Because your mindset is all about self and my pergola, my paving, my lawn, my roses and all of my hobbies. It's very sobering things, isn't it? Have a think about this man. The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. ASV says the zeal for your house will consume me. I wonder if we've ever been accused for thinking too much about God. I don't think so. Christ was consumed by the things of the Father. So in verse 10 and 11, therefore the heavens above has withheld the dew and the earth has withheld its produce. And I call for a drought on the hill, on the land and the hills and the grain, the new wine, the oil, and on what the ground brings forth on man and beast and all of their labors. I did that, says God. I've called for all of these bad things. And that's the principle of the law, isn't it? With Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus chapter 26, you do the right thing, you're blessed. You do the wrong thing, you're not. God says, you're stingy with me. I'll be stingy with you. Don't expect to just coast through right life, says God, and thinking you'll get away and have a marvellous existence and just float into my kingdom. It's, it's not going to be happening. Well, in verse 12, we have a pivotal verse. 
This is the most wonderful verse, isn't it? It starts with, then. They decided to do something about it. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. What a beautiful, beautiful verse. Let's pick up two lessons from this verse. The first lesson is that we cannot hope to obey God and live a godly life without prophetic direction. It took the prophets to initiate right doing. We cannot hope to obey God without direction in 2022 from his word. That would be foolish, wouldn't it? We cannot hope to, to serve our father and not seek direction from him through his word. We have to maintain that every single day. If we don't, we're going to go off track. And the second lesson from this is that we note the consistent order, brothers and sisters. Look in verse 12 and look at the order there. Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, first, the governor. Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, second. And all the remnant of the people, third. Governor, high priest, people. Not just people, all of the people. And that exact same order is repeated a further three times. Might be an opportunity to colour them in, if you wish, or at least make a little note. So we've just done that one in verse 12. It's a rubbable, Joshua and, the, and all the people. Verse 14. Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. Three groups, same order, every time. Chapter 2 and verse 2. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people. Chapter 2 and verse 4. Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all ye people. Three groups, same order every single time. You'd sort of question yourself. You're saying, hey, guy, we know you like to speak in bullet points. I think we get who the high priest is. What's the repetition here? And the repetition is the responsibilities that have been accepted in this. So Zerubbabel and Jehoshua stood up every single time. Neither of them are omitted. Every single time they stood up and they accepted their leadership responsibilities. Now, leadership is an important concept. Leadership doesn't mean being the boss or the manager or necessarily cracking a whip or ordering the ecclesia around. That's not leadership. Leadership is, is seeing what's right and initiating it. Someone showed leadership perhaps 35 years ago in identifying a place for a campsite. Here we are today because someone put their hand up and said, we should do this. Someone else said, we should explore it. Someone else said, we should fund it. Someone else said, hey, let's have some working bees. Leadership gets things going. We all have leadership. We have maybe arranging brethren groups. We have committee groups. We have young people groups. We have organizing groups. We have camp groups. We all need to do our thing. We don't crack, we crack whips. We just show leadership every single time. And Zerubbabel and Jehoshua, Joshua, we're at the front of the ecclesia, every single list. But the, 
the people have responsibilities too. They're there every time too. And it doesn't say most of the people or some of the people or the people. It says all of the people. And it says it every single time. So I can't sit back and, I, and say, you know what? That's the recorder's problem. He needs to get on top of that. I, I can't say that's the AB's problem. You know, what are you doing? Rising up. I, I can't just absolve myself of responsibilities in the ecclesia. I've, I've got to be part of that. I've got to support it. I've got to be integral in the workings and outcomes of the work of God. And that's why Haggai repeats it one, two, three, four times. Same order, same entities, same descriptions, because we're all in this together. The leaders need to lead, and there's a lot of leaders. Talked to a couple of brothers earlier between the breaks about our leadership shadow, the, the, the shadow that we all cast, the values that we project, the things we believe in, we're all leaders. And the people need to participate and be there and support the work as well. In verse 12, and they obeyed and they feared the Lord at the end of that verse Fear, of course, is reverence and respect. They feared God. They knew he was right. And perhaps we don't sometimes have enough of that genuine fear of God. Wow, what a, what a wonderful principle to fear the Father in heaven. And then in verse 13, Haggai says, the messenger of the Lord spoke to the people with the Lord's message. And he said, I am with you declares the Lord. That's that shortest message. It's the shortest message in all of the minor prophets. Two Hebrew words. I'm with you. Uh, I really don't know whether God said a lot more. He may have and he may well not have, but it just speaks volumes about how guy is a person. You've done all of, this is what you need to do, and you've responded and, and God's on board. I'm with you. You know, it's, it's like an equation for Haggai. There's a, a gap, a deficiency, fill the gap, and things work out. It's just very, very simple on Haggai's plane here. And so God was with them. All the people roused themselves to do their part. And verse 14, and the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and they, they worked. That's where we get our title from. They worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month in the sixth month in the second year of Darius, the king. Now, one more colouring. Let's colour in the word work. Or make a note of it or mark it, or, or do whatever. This is important to make our Bibles work for us, to be fair. So in, in chapter 1 and verse 14, they came and worked. It's a fundamental principle of Haggai. 1 verse 14, they came and worked. Two verse 4, middle of the verse. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord. And the third and final one is in 2 verse 14. Then Haggai answered and said, so is it with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands. There's a real emphasis there on, on doing things. Now, I could have 10 slides on these sorts of quotes which talk about the need for the disciple of Christ and the son and daughter of our father to work. This is a selection that we, we know, we're familiar with all of these quotes. Deuteronomy 28, I'll bless the work of your hands. That's the chapter of blessings and cursings. You do the right thing, you get blessed. You do the wrong thing, you don't. I'll bless all the work of your hands. Psalm 62, you will render to a man according to his work. Mark 13, he puts his servants in charge, each with his work. Each one's got a job to do. 
John 6, the question, what must we do to be doing the works of God? 1 Corinthians 3, fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Titus 3, be careful to devote yourselves to good works. And finally, in Revelation 2, I know your works. Repeated a further six times to each of the ecclesias, all seven of them. I know what you've done. I know your works. In the end, that's the litmus. You can't have your faith without your works. You can't have your works without your faith. I know your works and so that's why in chapter 1, verse 14, it's so special that they came and worked on what? The house of God. Not their own pergola, not their own sealed, panelled living room, not their own things. They came and worked on the house of God. Now, working together, the opposite of that, and it's quite beautiful, we've just seen this in our readings in 2nd of Thessalonians 3, perhaps about a week ago. Not to be disorderly. So there's a concept there of working together, Zerubbabel, Joshua, all the people doing the same thing. Paul picks up in 2nd of Thessalonians 3, three times. He says there in verse 6, withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received from us not working at all. Verse 6, verse 7, verse 11, disorderly. It's a, great, it's a great Greek word. There's various translations there in the NIV of being idle and disruptive. In the New American Standard Bible of being unruly. In the Amplified Bible of being undisciplined. In the CEV of loafing around. And it's illustrated there of, you know, we, we should be marching in unison. We should be doing the right things in an orderly process and contributing to our ecclesia at Salisbury. And Paul says, don't be disorderly. Don't just branch out and say, look, that's cool, but I want to do this, or I object to that, or I got a cool new way of doing this, or I think I can bring this into my area and do it this way. That's disorderly, says Paul. And you'd probably be familiar with uh, that great line at the top there, you can't rock the boat if you're rowing it. There's only two sorts of people in the ecclesia. There's the people that are rowing forward and the people that are disorderly or loafing around. You can't rock the boat if you're busy rowing the boat. Great little line there from this gentleman who works at one of the American universities. Some people are working to row the boat forward while others are rocking the boat and making it more difficult to navigate. I've concluded, he said, that if you are all working full time to row the boat, you don't have the time or energy to be rocking it. That's great, isn't it? That happens in family life, doesn't it, mums and dads? You sit around your kitchen table at the end of the day, you've got the opportunity to be rowing together rarely happens, but parents need to coach children, mentor them, love them, and teach them ways so that a family rows together. And of course, it has to happen in the ecclesia because the ecclesia is made up of many individuals and many families, and that's, that's 10 times harder for us all to row together. And our example is on a piece of paper and absent in the, in the, in the heavens above. But there's only two people. You either row together in the ecclesia or you're loafing or heading off in a different direction. And Haggai says, well done, Israel, for working together, all of them. It's a rubber Joshua, and all of the people on every single occasion. Now, let's talk about work for a minute I think we all get the concept of work. You know, they often start with, on a grand scale, on a bigger scale, with some sort of concept, some sort of plan, maybe a campsite. And you start to think about how to finance it, what approvals you need, what resources you need, what support you need. What do we need to get this thing to happen? 
And then once you've evaluated all of that, you might move forward to designing that piece, getting a concept design or a full detailed design and get some drawings together and some documents that say, this is what we want to do. Then you give it to someone else and they'll bring some machinery in or some other things and they'll, they'll build the plan and the project and they'll get it done. And then at the end, you can hand it back and say, here's the keys and this is how you should maintain it. And this is the instructions and all the rest. We do that every day. None of that works, brothers and sisters, without a plan. None of that will ever come without someone standing up and saying, I have a plan. This campsite exists because someone said, I've just had an idea and they've fleshed it out into a plan. So we can't work unless we have a plan. And there's lots of cool little things that we can Google to our heart's content. A goal without a plan is just a wish. It's pretty true though, isn't it? I have a goal to do this, but unless I plan it, I'm not gonna do it, am I? And I happen to be working in local government and we do planning pretty well. I'm not saying we always deliver all of this, but we're known for our planning, maybe not so much for our delivery. And on the right side, you can see that, that we've got this, this future vision of 2040. We're gonna, be, we're gonna be this by then. And then we work backwards and we've got strategic plans, long-term financial plans, asset management plans, workforce management plans, lots of 10-year plans. And then we bring it back even closer into a, a four-year business plan for the next four years. And then we bring it back into a one-year plan so that hopefully my one year feeds into the four year, which feeds into the 10 year, which feeds into my vision. And we get awards for making that stuff up. Works. But I wonder if we should be doing that ourselves. I have a vision. I probably can't articulate it super well if you ask me to, but I know, I know what my vision is. I think you do too. Have we written it down? And then have we ever worked backwards and said, what work do I need to do to achieve my vision? Because remember, a goal, a vision, without a plan is just a wish. It's just a dream. We're not going to accidentally get into the kingdom of God. So how do we do that? Well, a good thing to have in this life is a life plan. And they could take maybe one of two horizons. And the horizons may differ a little bit according to our age. We may have a life plan that says, I want to be here at the end of my life or when Christ returns. Or we might have a short-term plan, maybe a year's plan, maybe a 2022 plan or a two-year plan that says, in this point of time, I want to be there. My work does that and we get there. Should we do the same thing? I think we should. And the way to plan that out is to set some smart goals, things that and you wouldn't know the word smart, the specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, timeliness, those sorts of things, some smart goals that we can achieve. They might be, I want to be baptized. It might be, I've just turned 60 and I need to get my health in order. It might be that I want to do some education. I'm finishing high school and I want to go down this path. It might be that there's a certain job opportunity that down the track I need to pursue. Remember, we don't have two plans. We have, we have one life. We have a life before the Father, one life serving God. So our health is part of our life. It's not separate. We don't have a plan for God and health sits over there. We are one person, one life, one service to God. We have a life plan. And then secondly, we can develop some actions. 
You know, we talked about the need to take prophetic direction. Ideally, and I'll use that word very carefully, brothers and sisters, ideally we'd be reading the word, I think, following Brother Robert's advice. I think it's brilliant advice. I know that that's not a measure for everyone. I get that. If we can achieve that, that's wonderful. But remember, mums, and the difficulty of getting our children to school from little years to big years and even teenagers doesn't get a whole lot easier. Remember the merits and the virtue of just doing five verses or 10 verses, each according to our capability and our time. Remember, brothers, the opportunities that we have during the day. Remember all the time we spend in the cab of the truck or the front of the car and the opportunity that we have to fill our minds with something. What's it going to be? So a plan can say, you know what? I think I can do those readings every day. I've been a little bit lax. Last year hasn't been great. COVID's changed things. But to be honest, I think I can. And a plan might be, I'm going to do the first reading in the morning. Write it down. First reading in the morning. And then I'm going to do my second or third with the family or some sort of other arrangement. It's got to suit you. It's got to suit me. It's my life plan. I need to articulate that. We might have a Christ-like discipleship attribute. My focus for the first week is on kindness or being graceful, or being loving, or smiling? What's my plan going to include for developing the mind and character of our Lord? Or what about a course? Enrolling in something? What about reading a book? I'm going through the ways of providence at the moment, nearly finished. I love it with some other brothers. I've got a quote or two later on in these slides. Absolutely magnificent. Write down, I want to read this book and I commit to at least 10 pages a week. And as I said to someone over breakfast, the only constant in life, apart from death, of course, is time. If we read 10 pages a week, in two weeks, we would have done 20. Three weeks, we would have done 30. And in a couple of months, or maybe four or five months, we would have finished that book. Time is a constant. But unless we just sit down and say, I want to read that, we will not read it. Unless we articulate that or write to it or commit to it, we won't do that. So we could add that to our life plan as well. And let's be honest with ourselves. No one's getting younger. So let's put some exercise in there as well. I need to do a 20-minute walk every morning. I need to get out to the shed do some curls or whatever we do. That's our life plan. But ultimately, that plan has got to fit into your goals to serve God and to give him glory as best we can. Without a plan, we are wandering with a plan and God's blessing. We can do great things. As I said, we've just been going through the ways of providence I think my favourite chapter in the entirety of that book written by Brother Roberts is the chapter on David. It's a beautiful, beautiful chapter. Brother Roberts writes this in that chapter. He says, an enlightened man will not wait till he can do a great thing. If a man waits till he can do a great thing, he will never do anything at all. Do the little things faithfully, and these may grow great. Things that are considered great are made up of many littles, and the man who scorns the little will never reach the great. Magnificent. Let's not scorn the little. Let's not scorn the help and the kindness of putting an arm around someone as COVID permits at the moment, giving a hug and support. Let's not scorn the sweeping of the kitchen. Let's not scorn reading five verses to our children every morning. Those littles become big. Those littles get children's minds into the kingdom of God because mum and dad believe the scriptures and they will too. 
in the absence of the word of God, the little ones see no evidence at all of God in their lives. How are they going to be here in 10 or 20 or 30 years time by accident? Brother Robert says, focus on the little things faithfully every day. Page here, page next day, 10 verses, chapter, some of this, some of that. Call, text, dear brother, why, missed you, longing to see you. Little things every single day. And they amount to a great thing. And I thank Brother Roberts for putting that so candidly. Well, hasn't Haggai given us some wonderful things to think about? What on earth are you doing, he says, in the city of ways? 15 years of sitting around doing your own things. Come on, we've got to get going. Partners with Zechariah, motivates the people. Zerubbabel says, I'm in. Joshua says, I am too. The people follow and they started working. That is beautiful. And we thank them all for that example. Some take-homes from study number three. That's a challenge, isn't it? Serving ourselves is robbing God. When I sit down and do all my own things all day, every day, I'm denying God of the glory that he actually rightfully is due. I need to think of that. You possibly do too. Be consumed by the truth like our Lord. It ate him up all day, every day. You know, I get that we can't live a life like Christ. We do need to have a home. We do need to paint it and maintain it every now and then. Yeah, I do need to mow my lawn. But Christ did everything for his father. He did the minimal in this life to maximize his opportunities in the next. He loved his brothers and sisters. He gave his life for us, his own life. He was eaten up by his God. What a wonderful, wonderful example. And finally, if we want to work for our Father, a good thing to do is to have a life plan. Where am I going? How am I going to work? Reading of Israel won't happen by accident. We've got to sit down at some point and say, you know what, I've been dreaming about this for years. Let's do it. We've got to map these things out. How many, how often, when, where, commit to it in writing. And if we keep that, maybe a page a week or a couple of pages a week or whatever you do, you look back over that in six months, you'll say, wow, that has changed my life. And I'm inspired by the people here who responded to Haggai. They worked Zerubbabel and Joshua and every single one of the nation. What a great example. Mm -hmm.